The following may contain offensive language, adult humor, and or content that some viewers may find offensive. The views and opinions expressed by any one speaker does not explicitly or necessarily reflect or represent those of Mark Rattledge or W2M Network. Please listen with caution, or don't listen at all. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You are listening to a Rattledge and Broadcasting Premier Podcast. This is the Mothership, baby! Long road to ruin, and I am your host, the Mandata report, Reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Rattledge. And over to that side is my brother from another mother and a pretty cool fruit who really knows where his towel is at. Ladies and gentlemen, he's Sean, you're not. How do you do, sir? We mate mate. All righty. We're just letting it all hang out. Yes, sir. Because Thank Mark's you. got some place to be and I'm tired as fuck. <laughs> so this is a, um, it's so, so funny. Um, in the on and off again uh, storied relationship that is Sean and Mark, the love affair that that lasted through space and time, um, We one of the things that we said was, hey, there's some long road to ruins that we recognize may not have been quality and that we were going to reduce some. And Sean, Sean, you know, had like a, you know, a scroll that he wrapped up, you know, toilet paper deep and was just like, here's all the ones we're redoing. And I was like, there's one, there's fucking one I want to redo. And it was this one. Uh, tonight we are talking the four lethal <clears throat> weapon movies. And part of the reason why I wanted to redo them was we never finished it. Number one. Number two, it's not one I did with Sean. It's one I did with Chris Evans, I believe from um the casual heroes back when that was a thing and i couldn't tell you fuck what we talked about on that show so uh on this 87th iteration of sean and mark talk about movies for an hour i thought okay well this is one that i i definitely wanted to redo it's one i wanted to do with sean and it's one i'm really happy to talk about sean what's your um relationship to the lethal weapon franchise not much um, I'm actually too young to really have too many memories of the first one. Mm -hmm. I the, the I think Lethal Weapon two hit theaters. I was a kid, like as in. Yeah, let me help you. The first one. I'm in I'm in I'm in eighty I'm in eighty two, and I seem to remember. I could mm -hmm. be wrong. It, I think I seem to remember it hearing about it about the same time as uh Burton's Batman. Okay, so around um, around first... that time. The first one is 87, the second one is 89, the third one is 92, and the fourth one is 98. Yeah. Um the third I the third I remember a little bit better. Four I remember hearing about, mm -hmm. but I never bothered but I never bothered seeing it and I remember that every time I've seen this movie, these movies I've been kind of baffled at just how good they are even when they're not really that great. You know what I was funny? Um, so for those of you who are listened to, watched Long Road to Ruin before, you know that uh, much like Damn You Hollywood, but for franchises, we go into strict deconstruction. Although there is the occasional Sean and I just pick up an instrument and play. This is going to be one of those shows. There's no, there's no real strong structure to tonight's show other than we'll go in sequential order. 
But uh, Sean and I are just going to kind of talk lethal weapon for an hour and then uh, jump out of the parachute saying we regret nothing. Just jump out of the plane, rather. <clears throat> um, that being said, so 1987, I'm 11, and I probably saw the first lethal weapon in the movies. At, at best, I definitely saw it at home on HBO because we were hoity. Um, and we had cable TV um, in my richy rich home. And in any case, I know, bougie ass. that's my bougie ass. Ugh. It's bourgeoisie, you uncultured swine. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I, I know I saw the first two. I don't remember if I saw the third one um, until this rewatch. And the same thing with the fourth one. I, I'm watching this and I'm like, I don't remember. Like Jet Li kind of seems familiar, but I but who knows? I could be mixing that up with a m bunch of these. But Lethal Weapon was one of those uh, movies from what I remember as a kid I, I really liked it was a lot of fun action you know a lot of fun action i didn't quite get the gravity of what the first one was talking about and you know robert said it last night when we were talking civil war and damn you hollywood uh it's a genuinely strong arc that mel gibson's martin riggs goes through from one to four um it's a, as silly and over the top and stupid at times as lethal weapon tends to be it is remarkable how they kept the quality up over four films. It actually kind of stands alone in the pantheon of movie franchises that went past three that still that managed to keep the quality pretty consistent from one through four, which is a feat. I, I tend to I, I tend to look at it this way. Lethal Weapon didn't invent the um didn't invent the buddy cop movie any more than Friday the 13th invented the slasher. Yeah. Like Friday the 13th, it didn't invent the genre, but Richard Donner, Joel Silver, Mel Gibson, and Danny Glover did their absolute fucking damnedest with that first movie to perfect it. And I don't know that too many buddy cop movies, aside from maybe Tango and Cash and the first Bad Boys, mm -hmm. have quite as close since. Yeah. One thing I want to say about it before we get into um, some of the nuts and bolts of this, and then we can just start talking movies, is when I think about Richard Donner, um, I think about uh, the, the Donner cut of Superman 2 and, you know, Superman 3. And Donner kind of like, uh, what's his nuts from the last two Batman movies? Um, I mean, like the... Joel Schumacher. Thank you. You can re Just like Robert, you can read my mind when I'm struggling. Kind of like Donner and Schumacher, their similarities are in that they don't give a fuck about source material or lore or anything. They look at the people and go, here, they, they, the Vince McMahon of movie making, minus the sex perversions, maybe, um, that we know about. It's, it's, they, they just have a read on people and they give the people what they want <clears throat> and they are not interested in making a point. <laughs> they are not interested. And if, if 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 it happens, great. But Richard Don, I, I watching the Lethal Weapon movies, all four of these, that was kind of like my my takeaway, my grand takeaway from all four of these is how much fun Richard Donner wants the audience to have watching these, and could give a fuck less how unrealistic it is, how busy they are, or how in some points how shallow they tend to be. He's just like. You know what? I have great actors. I've got great production people. I've got people that can create great stunts. We're going to have ourselves a maximum use of the film medium for pure enjoyment. And that is, I think, one of Lethal Weapon's like lasting uh, successes and impressions in the movie industry. What do you think? May I, may I differ very slightly? You may. What Richard Donner does best, I think and I think Superman kind of proves this, isn't mm -hmm. so much that he doesn't have a point to make and that he's just having fun. I think it's just that he finds unique ways to get you to suspend your disbelief mm -hmm. and just wholly... Because what's the whole thing about Superman? You will believe a man can fly. Sure. It's because... And it's there. there's no one thing that he does that explains it, really. Mm -hmm. He finds a way to create an atmosphere and characters and a world in whatever he's making, whether it's a buddy cop movie or an adaptation of the pillar of detective comics, where just 
everything is plausible for as long as your eyes are glued to are glued to the screen. You are just in. And I would and, and feel free to disagree with me here. Mm. I would even say that one of the things that I like about the action in the first lethal weapon is the fact that it's not your standard Michael Bay, J.J. Abrams, pyrotechnic bukkake. <laughs> it's over the top. It's silly. It's spectacle. It's supposed to be thrilling, but there's mm-hmm. still kind of a, a punch and a grit to yeah. everything that just makes it a little bit easier to sink your teeth into than, and I say this as a huge Matrix fan, all of a sudden, Carrie Ann Moss hovering in the air for a good six seconds before delivering a Mirko Krokop crane kick <laughs> to the head to the head of a man in black. Um, and I I think I think that's really impressive. I think that is a dedication to craft and it does cement him as an auteur. I think what I re- that he wasn't making a point, but he was making fun. Yeah, no, and and I think that's what I was trying to get at is. Richard Donner, and at some point we're going to have to do a triple feature of Richard Donner movies now, now that I'm saying this. Yeah. Um, I really want to celebrate this man because I think, and somewhere out there, Chris Bailey is about to laugh laugh his ass off at what I'm about to say and point at me and go, you, you, Rattledge. I think we sometimes forget as people who are um, film idiots, film buffs, film snobs, that this mm-hmm. is also supposed to be fun and entertaining. And mm-hmm. while I think there's room in this world for appreciation and deconstruction, I think Richard Donner is one of those standard bearers of, of people who, who remind us that this is supposed to be a fun time. This is supposed to be for enjoyment and not, you know, it's not a documentary series. It's not, it, you know, there's a lot of things you can get from the movie. It's, it's, it's funny. I love the Nicole Kidman, like AMC thing now where, you know, it was after COVID and it was like, welcome back to the movies. And one of the things that they say in the net, net, that narration is, you know, movies, how they make us feel, they make us laugh. They make, you know, because we, these are stories we can relate to modern mythology, things like that thing, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, and I think Richard Donner subscribes to that. I think he knows that we're making, we're making movies, pal for people to relate to see themselves in and enjoy and take a break from the, uh, the upward slog that is life. With that said, yeah. believe the weapon franchise is in fact, an American buddy cop action comedy media franchise created by Shane black. It focuses on two Los Angeles police department detectives, Martin Riggs played by Mel Gibson and Richard uh, Roger Murtaugh uh, played by Danny Glover, who is too old for this shit. The franchise consists of a series of four films released between 87 and 98 and a television series which aired from 2016 to 2019. They were all directed by Richard Donner and they share many of the same cast members. Um, Yada, yada, yada. All right. So the first one, um, it was co-produced by Jill Silver. Uh, It also starred Gary (laughs) Busey, Tom Atkins, Darlene Love and Mitchell Ryan. Uh, it was made for 15 million and was a amazing financial success. I made 120.2 million dollars, and if I remember correctly, it was uh, it was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Sound, which it absolutely deserves. Um, so I'm not going to do a huge plot recitation. I'm just going to do a quick wiki read here. Anxious with age and retirement, homicide detective Richard Marta is partnered with young and suicidal narcotics, like we often are. Uh, Narcotics officer Martin Riggs, Mel Gibson. Together, they work the case of an alleged suicide of Amanda Hunsacker, who's Jackie Swanson, daughter of a wealthy businessman who served with Merton in Vietnam. Merton Riggs soon discovered that Hunsacker was involved in a heroin smuggling scheme led by retired General Mitchell and his lead enforcer, Gary Busey. Sean, one of the things I love about this movie actually is that it is the quasi touching on mental illness. Um, Riggs. A yeah, uh, Mel Gibson's character is struggling with the death of his wife um, and the feelings thereafter. He is struggling with depression, uh, suicidal ideations. And this is the story of a guy who, it's not redemption, he finds a found family in Danny Glover's family and he finds a reason for living, you know, all of those things. And so you get slices of a fun buddy cop movie, you get a lot of action, but you also get this really nice family uh, sort of family dynamic 
And the lesson that you take from Lethal Weapon is, you know, family is where you find it, not in who you're blood related to, which is a nice message. I think it's also on the, you know, when you feel like when you've lost a loved one and you feel like there's nothing worth fighting for and, you know, nothing worth going on for. And then people come along in your life and you go, these people are worth living for. These people give me these people give me meaning. And that's Mm -hmm. Mel Gibson's story throughout this. So. I really, really like the first Lethal Weapon movie. Um, it's it's funny because like I just took my kids to go see Civil War, and I show my kids a lot of stuff. I showed them Friday. Jonas actually just I showed them not that long ago the first Deadpool movie, um, and yes, we fast forwarded through the sex of through all seasons, um, and he just watched Deadpool too. They they are they have definitely been exposed to a lot of like. Pretty you are never too stuff. young to see Ryan Reynolds get pet. No, actually, there are some things you can absolutely be too young for. Never mind. Yeah, thanks. Um, but uh, I was <laughs> I was going to show him the first Lethal Weapon movie, and then I kind of read through the uh, the IMDb parent thing, and I was like, eh, maybe we skip this. And then upon rewatching it, listen, my son could handle Civil War. He could have handled Lethal Weapon. But it's one of those where I was like, eh, let's wait till he gets a little bit older. And the reason why I say that is, boy, is Lethal Weapon even though I saw it when I was 11, more than likely, it's a gr- it's a pretty gritty, pretty brutal, in places, dark movie. That last fight that um, Mel Gibson has on, like, the, the front lawn, I think it is, <clears throat> um, it's pretty, <clears throat> pretty bone-crunching. What's your thoughts on the first Lethal Weapon? Thoughts on the first one. Um, I want to backtrack a little bit something you said about the movies having no message. I... You're mostly right. I think that I think it has no message it's seriously trying to get across. Yeah. Cynically, however, it's very evident, especially I think from watching the first the first two and to a lesser extent the third, mm-hmm. that they're also looking for some classic um some classic low-hanging fruit and straw men. Mm-hmm. They can use to kind of, to kind of set their conflict. Um, I'm not enough of a pop culture historian to necessarily know this for a fact. It wouldn't surprise me if the reason why so many action movies in the '80s focused on the drug trade as being the linchpin of the big bad criminal exercise mm-hmm. is the fact of hey, it was the heart of the war, the heart of the ultimately failed war on drugs. So it wouldn't you know, surprise me if podcasts and how the drug war changed this country in many ways, in, in a lot of negative ways. It changed law enforcement. I, yeah. It changed the military. It changed the culture. And it's still something that we are wrestling with and losing today. Whole other well, but yeah, that is but, a whole other discussion. But the reason that but the reason I bring that in particular up when it comes to the first lethal weapon, and I'll come back to this briefly over the course of the next couple as mm-hmm. it kind of rears its head again is because I just kind of get the feeling that there might have been some none too subtle suggestions made when looking for municipal cooperation, especially maybe from local law enforcement Mm -hmm. that were thinking, gee, you know, we'd sure be much more amenable to taking part in your little action movie if you managed to wedge in there just a nice anti-drug message. (laughs) Um which it, it, it it's kind of it's kind of the same way I feel about the really repetitious uh, German slash Nazi jokes mm-hmm. in the second movie. It's uh, it's like it's, but it also kind of speaks to something else about this movie that's going to be a running theme throughout all four, and it's throughout a lot of franchises, and that is. It's not always innovation that makes the difference. Sometimes it's just quality iteration. Mm-hmm. I mentioned Friday the 13th earlier. Is it the first slasher movie? Fuck no. Halloween isn't even the first. For that, you got to go all the way back to Psycho. But the fact is, each of those movies took the formula, took the conventions, took a lot of the symbolism, and then just dressed it in their own they kind of attired it in their own carefully chosen window dressing if mm-hmm. i'm to maybe sound a little maybe a little too high-minded about it um i do like the fact it's funny to me it's kind of like how 
again, the horror comparison, you know how, how people always, for some reason, some people always seem to think that Jason Voorhees wielded a chainsaw. Yeah. They thought that his, that his whole thing was hockey mask and chainsaw, but it's really kind of a misremembrance. Mm. Well, in buddy cop movies, there's always that loose cannon who don't follow the rule, but he gets the job done. <laughs> um, well, this is kind of the prototypical loose cannon, except the thing is, and, and you made a great point, um, is the fact that he's not a loose cannon who's just a who's just a, a kind of a scuzzy dickwad who happens to be who happens to be good at his job. Yeah, he's not Vic Mackey. Um, no, and he's and he's and he's not he's not Chris Tucker in Rush in Rush Hour either. Right. Um, he's a guy who has some legit some legitimate issues and yeah there's a good reason why a lot of people think he should probably he should probably be pulled off duty and it's kind of a testament to the fact that this was mel gibson kind of entering the height of his powers oh yeah before ever before everything else we think of first he was legitimately one of the most bankable actors in hollywood and in this one, he really surprises you with how much he brings to it because he's bringing personality, good looks, um, an appropriately Path. manic sense of character. Pathos. And he come and he comes across as being very much up for any action that's ta that's taking place. He's fair, he's fairly believable. I want to jump in here and really draw that out a little bit and let's talk about it because um yeah, let's without skipping too far ahead into the other movies what mel gibson does and i bring this up because it's come up on our review of the boys it's come up in some other places the thing about my podcast in particular is it's done by fairly bright individuals who are also men and recognize very uh vocally the need for men to talk about what's going on with them emotionally and mentally um and how men are not often taught the language of feelings. And so we struggle expressing them to many times, much to the frustration of the women that we are with in our lives. And if you watch Mel Gibson over the course of four movies, this is a character very much struggling with his own mental, mental health, struggling with his emotions and wanting to communicate them with his best friend and not really knowing how but also taking into account that we are taught, maybe not in my son's generation, certainly not by this father. Um, I have very much taught my son it is okay to have fit. You were, he came home the other day, saw the dog had made a mess, was really angry about it, was like flip the table angry. And I was like, what is your problem in life? Because I'm like, is this a you don't want to clean up after your own dog or is this something else? He's like, no, I'll clean up after the dog just fine. I'm just mad that I... I didn't make the mess, but I have to clean it up. And I'm like, you're entitled to be mad. You still have to be responsible and take care of your pet and take care of this house. You live here. Yeah. He was like, he was like I understand yeah. that. And I'm, but thank you for letting me just be mad. And I'm like, yeah, go be mad. Yeah. So, but if you'll, but Sean, I know you probably went through this. I know I went through this. A lot of us boys went through this over the last, you know, decades of growing up. Uh, boys don't cry. Boys don't talk about their feelings. And then, and so relating that back to Mel Gibson, he is very much, I was just thinking about this with this last movie, um, uh, number four, that I watched it today, where he's talking to Danny Glover on the boat, and I think it's this one or it's the third one, and he's like, Danny Glover's like, what is going on with you? Like, why why are you acting this way? What is, what is your problem in life? And Mel Gibson, in a beautiful performance, in a movie where there's a lot of nonsense and a lot of, like, cartoon antics, is going... Ah, you know, this is like I'm just going through a thing. And it's like I have a, ah, but you don't really want to hear this. Like he is desperately crying for help, but he can't for the life of him get it out because you no, know, you don't want to look like a pussy. And to talk about what's bothering you makes you a pussy. That's what we're taught. And the fact that these movies sort of touch on that and go, no, 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 this is important stuff. This is why a lot of guys struggle throughout their lives because they have this inside of them and they don't always have someone to talk to and they certainly don't have the language to express it. And I love the fact that these movies touch on that. And would, you say that, would you say that Lethal Weapon was maybe a little bit ahead of its time in that regard? Way ahead of its time. 
Like to the point where if I showed my son this now, he would look at me and go like, why didn't you just tell him what's bothering him? Like I, oh, I, I told, it, it is commonplace to ask my children, what is bothering you? It's okay to have feelings. It's okay to be mad. I actually just had this conversation with my daughter too. She was upset about something. And I'm like, well, it's okay for you to feel that way. It's okay for you to be frustrated. It's okay for you to express your feelings. Um, I wish someone had told me that when I was their age, instead of me in turning inward and then raging outward as I did for most I'll, ra I'll, I'll raise you wishing someone had told my dad that when yeah. he, when he was a lot, I mean, granted, you know, considering when he grew up, that mm -hmm. obviously wasn't happening. Um, <laughs> but no, absolutely, absolutely spot on. Is it, is it a clinically perfect portrayal of mental illness? Well, no, it's not. But at the same time, Mel still brings enough genuine threads of it to the performance that I think when it comes to any performance like that, if you can recognize at least something, doesn't matter if it's a, if it's a stage play, if it's a movie, a sitcom, a pro wrestling promo, if there's something in there that, that harkens to something that you've, ex that you've experienced that really rings a bell and and really kind of and really kind of perks your ear up, then you know you you don't have to be Sir right. Lawrence Olivier. You <laughs> just have to you just have to be a human being who can conceptualize those emotions of loss, not seeing a way forward, and sometimes and this one I've definitely been through. Okay. Um, sometimes wanting to die but not quite having it to kill yourself last thing i want to bring up um and then we can move on to lethal weapon too so again relating it to my personal life you know i have a found family in the rattle and broadcasting network i have my brothers and sister you know whom i love dearly uh and i make a lot of jokes about it but it's the truth you know like the, these the, <laughs> this is my found family um and i couldn't i could not go on without you guys uh, and I like the oh. fact that Lethal Weapon touches on that, too. And that is, you know, M M um, Riggs and Murtaugh could not be, you know, they are Ebony and I are free, literally. <laughs> they are. They could not be two side, you know, two different sides of the same coin. But they find each other and there is a there is a, a you know, a brotherhood. There is a love. There is a family in this. You know, this family just brings in Mel Gibson and welcomes him with open arms. And that is the way it is through the rest of these movies. And. It follows with Joe Pesci, it follows with Rene Russo, and then finally it follows with Chris Rock. Everyone that kind of gets sucked, much like the Rattle Legend Broadcasting Network, you get sucked into our orbit, you become part of the family, and you stay there forever. Um, and it's great. And I and I think it's a wonderful message. It's so funny, like, not that long ago, you and I talked about the Home Alone fr uh, franchise, and it's like, that's a very cynical, horrible-looking family. Like, 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 the message in those movies is family is terrible. In Lethal Weapon, family is awesome. That's the message I get from these movies. It's pretty amazing. Do you mind if I bring something up that I... It actually just occurred to me right before we got on the air, and I just just remembered that I wanted to run it by you. Go, and then we're going um, to Lethal Weapon 2. That, that, that's, that's fine, but, but I got to give some flowers to Danny Glover for a moment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, you, you having a few years on me. Do you remember when the Cosby show debuted? I'm going to go with 82 if I had to guess, but you keep going. And if I'm wrong, I'll yell at you. 82. Okay. So we're, we're about five years into the era when Bill Cosby, rapey hobgoblin though he is. <laughs> um, I'm off by two years. It's 84. Go on. Uh, okay. Okay. Fine. We're, we're one year in, which actually you know, might, might kind of change the, change the point of view a little bit. Um, but okay. So Cosby basically kicks down the door for representation of black families in America. Sure. Um, for, for kind of what, what professions black men are depicted in. Yeah. Um, even, and even when you're talking about cop movies from around that time, you're thinking, of, you're thinking about something like Beverly Hills cop and Eddie Murphy like like a, a black cop in a movie okay eddie murphy is you know still still pretty still pretty hood um 
it, but it's definitely not a depiction of a very clean cut suburban black family sure. that's that uh, that's kind that's kind of living right at home right at home among the white folks and just nobody's making boo about it um do, how do you think that stands that stands out and what do you think that says that says about um Danny Glover's portrayal of Murtaugh considering that it wasn't exactly common for the time you know Danny Glover's um Murtaugh and his family his fairly you know upper seemingly upper middle class well to do black family i feel like becomes the icon becomes like the structure because if you think about what happens throughout like the mid 90s so many other black families on television and movies are portrayed as the Murtaugh family just you know they 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 certainly have an authentic blackness about them but it, it gives way to more of an authentic american you know portrait of an american family not the Marilyn Manson album um when you think about like family matters uh you think about so many of the uh, later on you know the hanging with mr cooper and um the steve harvey show and you know martin you know you start to see you know you start to see after the cosby show and after lethal weapon so many other portrayals of black families as the spirit of american uh you know american the american family and it's great. I lo I love the fact that that that's good. But it, but I think if I pretty much, it's Cosby and then Danny Glover and then we're off to the races. Okay, follow up question. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of buddy cop movies, then when you think about something else like Bad Boys, which came on, what was it? Almost fifteen years after the first Lethal Weapon. Something Maybe. like at least ten. It was it was like at least ten years, but then but then when you think about but then when you think about that, does Bad Boys then does, does Bad Boys then feel like a like a step like more of a step backwards or just a lateral step in a different direction? No, and I would actually tell you it's a step up because um it's it's what the value of Bad Boy is showing you that you don't need a white and a white and a black guy to do the same shtick. You can have two black guys that's be true. just as successful. Good point. You know, the you're showing. The, I don't want to get you off on track here, so I'm going to say this. I'm going to go right into *Lethal Weapon* too. Um, sure. But one of the things that came up in the discussion of American fiction was the debate between how do you portray black people in, in American media and fiction? Um, do you portray them as the as the one way that people find the most interesting and maybe the most alien, but still the most entertaining? Or do you show the vast array of black people just as you would show the vast array of white people, which has which has more value, which is better? Um, and ultimately, the answer is which one sells more, you know, of whatever it is you're buying, whatever it is you're selling. Um, but I think if you're, I think if we had a black person on this panel, they would absolutely, you know, say it's probably better. To, well, I don't know um, because that's the debate that the two black people are having in American fiction. If you have one black person saying, "I I think you should portray black people as whatever sells." Just as you should portray white people as whatever sells. And then the other person saying, no, 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 that's dehumanizing. Show the array of the of the black experience, not just this one slice of it, because we're human beings and we deserve to be represented as such. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's about selling books or movies or cassette tapes or whatever. Cassette tapes, I'm a hundred, you know, <laughs> or <laughs> sorry, sorry, selling downloads to me just sounds dirty. Um so, but I think, you know, but I think that's I, a big a debate to be had. I, I I love that I love that I was the one who asked the question, and you actually came up with something that was that was so astute that it actually kind of made kind of made me rethink okay. a little a little bit and how I would have answered the same. So, um, Lethal Weapon Two uh, during a, it comes out in nineteen eighty nine, so it's two years later, and just for fun and profit. Uh, Lethal Weapon 2 is made on a, they doubled the budget. It's made on a budget of 30 million and makes a whopping $227.9 million. Hey, stupids, make your film for cheap. And then if it's a success, you make oodles and oodles of money. That's how this works. Um, I'm going to keep beating that drum. 
During a car chase, Riggs and Murtaugh stumble upon a trunk full of smuggled South African cougar, uh, cougarins. This sparks a series of attempts at their lives, forcing them to take a less dangerous case, protecting Leo Getz, who is Joe Pesci. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I fucking love Joe Pesci. Uh, a loudmouth whistleblower with whom they gradually bond and befriend. However, they realize that Getz was involved in the same South African illegal activities. As a result, the three men become entangled in a drug smuggling operation involving South African diplomats in Los Angeles. Using their immunity and biting wit as a shield, Riggs kills the murderer of his wife who was among the criminals. Yeah, this is like the fucking Batman thing where it's just like, you know, they write in later that the Joker killed him instead of Joe Chill. And it's just like, fuck you. Why? We don't. Not everything needs to be connected like that. Um, oh. It's my one my minor gripe with that movie. You're starting to say something. I wanted to let you go in. Are you good? No, no. Okay. I, I, I was agreeing. With you. I was. I was. I was saying. I was saying. I was saying. Nope. As it. Yeah. As in unnecessary, contrived. We never asked. You just. You really just did this for your own amusement. Don't try to yeah. tell me you didn't. This is. Um. So this is a continuation of the Riggs and Murtaugh binding, and you know Riggs being part of Murtaugh's family. I. I want to say it's the second one where he does the bit with the golden pen um you know and so he's still processing the loss of his wife while still you know finding reasons to live they're still playing around with the he's a little off thing you know they there's a great Chekhov's gun that they uh they show you in the first first act of the movie where he um is in a straight jacket and he just locates his shoulder to get out of it and then later on when they dump him in the drink um in un, in the same circumstances he just locates your shoulder again to get out of that. This is also the, the another standing thing with Riggs is he's afraid to love again. One, because he's still in love with his dead wife, but also he's afraid that he's kind of a black widow where every girl he touches dies. And so, but he finally, okay, I have to say this. And again, I'm not the shrieking violet of, of this network by far, but there are times where, I, I will recognize something like the male gaze, which you and I have talked about, you know, what's or who's these frigid, frigid nipples. Um, and there are things that I will go along with the touchy culture, not that kind of touchy, the sensitive culture, and go, no, 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 I see it too. I recognize it. Let me tell you how some of these movies don't fucking hold up right now in our current culture. And here's a great example of this. Riggs hitting on this woman to the point where, where he like fucks with her and he, you know, he's like, he's like great. He grabs her shopping cart and her shopping basket. And he's like, I'm going to yell. I'm going to yell rape or something. If you don't go out with me. And this goes on for an uncomfortable five fucking minutes where he finally gets his hot blonde to go on a date with him, which he clearly said, no, no, no. It's like the James Bond thing. A thousand no's and one. Yes. Means yes. Um, he is harassing the crap out of this woman. And the whole time, because it's, again, 1989, she's like, oh, hee hee, aren't you funny? Please get off me. And finally, she submits and agrees to go on a date with him as her, after he's assaulting her, essentially. And in 1989, you're just like, oh, that's right, Mel Gibbs. You take what you want, you handsome man. You, you, you absolutely harass this woman in a grocery store and force her to go on a date with you against her will. It's fine. And in 2024, I'm looking at this going, oof, <laughs> that's not aged yep. well at all. That is aged like milk. And I'm sorry, if like there's like red, you know, red-blooded American men watching this going, rattle it, you pussy. Come on, man. You if you try that now, you will be rightfully tased and dragged away. Um, <laughs> fucking thrown into Guantanamo Bay if you're not lucky. And I have to, and I have to point that out. Like it's not that it was uncomfortable for me, but I'm watching it with 2024 eyes going, oh, God, <laughs> how the world will change in 40 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's yeah, a, a lot of it just holds up abjectly terribly. And uh, it, it kind of reinforces a, a real Hang truth. She ends up I dead is the whole reason I went on that tangent is he, he gets yeah. her to go on the date. They have a lovely evening by the, on the beach and then they throw her in the drink. Oh, of course. Of yeah. course. Um, but for some reason, what it kept reminding me of is a truth that a lot of people need to think very hard about. And that is if you make a joke 
and somebody just kind of tells you that's not funny Mm -hmm. or they act put off by it, it doesn't mean they're offended. Chances are you're not important enough to be offensive to anybody. It's just that you're not fucking funny. Yeah. It's just that it's annoying. It's not offensive. Right. You're just irritated. It's kind of like with the German jokes throughout the throughout the entire the entire thing it's not that it's offensive it's that you, it's that you have one joke and it wasn't funny the first time nor was it funny the other dozen times you repeated it and yet through it all i am forced to acknowledge this as patently unlikable a sentient anal polyp of a human being as mel gibson is he does a great job of making Riggs thoroughly sympathetic the entire way through to the point where you are absolutely rooting for him to get his, to get his closure so mm-hmm. he can just go on with his life and be happy yeah. and grow and evolve past this. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it, it's remarkable. It, it's the cinematic equivalent to the fact that in real life, Yes, you would love it if someone would wind up with a Louisville slugger and swing for the fences right between Logan Paul's legs. <sighs> but you also can't deny the man's a professional wrestling prodigy either. <laughs> sure. In um, fact, it makes that kind of painful. There's a couple of things about this movie. One, they they up the... So the first one at least stays quasi-grounded <laughs> in some of the action scenes. Yes, but, well. They are utterly oh, abandoned that in the second um, one. It is so. No. Oh, no. It is so fucking stupid in the second one. And it only gets more patently absurd as this goes on. But it's just, there comes a point where you're just like, I'm not watching this, you know, to see a lot, you know, to see cops. You know, I'm watching this to see a fan. You know, the, my problem is with the with these Lethal Weapon movies is that. And I was thinking of this as I watched the fourth one today. I don't think people make this connection at all but i'm gonna make it and everyone's gonna go oh my god you're right the lethal weapon movies are the buddy cop version of the fast and the furious movies like it's that level stunt um and as i was watching the fourth and i was just like wow they they really just go for it in these movies where they you know like years later vin diesel's gonna drive a car through three buildings in saudi arabia um I think Sean froze and is probably going to get kicked out and come back. So, oh, wait, he's, I still hear him laughing. There he goes. A um, couple of things more while we wait for Sean to reset here and come back. I love Joe Pesci in this. And I, I, I after watching the entire series, because he's in two, three, and four, um, I think Joe Pesci, because he's, you know, kind of a fire hydrant and, you know, he's loud and obnoxious and, you know, I was uh, I quote my cousin Vinny all the time. Um, it's one of my, it's one of my people don't know this because I don't bring it up ever, and it's not a franchise. But I love my cousin Vinny. I think it's one of my like top twenty favorite movies because, and part of the reason is because Joe Pesci and Marissa Torme are fucking amazing in it. They they just give stellar performances with like low hanging fruit material, um, and but but part of it is because Joe Pesci doesn't get enough credit for being a phenomenal actor. You know, because, no, because he's no. taking parts like, you know, like gangsters and like Casino and um, and other movies, you know, or he's taking, you know, silly roles like this one where he's Leo Getz and he's annoying. But like Joe Pesci really does create a character with Leo Getz. And he has these moments of, you know, where you, where you feel really like when they beat the shit out of him towards the end of the movie. And like, I think it's the third act. Like you feel generally bad for the guy. You know, this this guy who's laundering money for the mob and all of that. So I love Joe Pesci. And I think he's, I think about a lot of modern franchises and like they introduce a character and it's like, you know, nails on a chalkboard. It's like Jar Jar Banks. You know, you're just like, ugh, I hate this character. And I wish they, you know, like whoever, whoever's making these movies just loves this character and they won't let him go. But I hate him as an audience member. And I don't have that with Joe Pesci in these. I think he, he adds a lot, especially towards the end. Um, we, we haven't gotten to it yet, and we're kind of skipping around in places, but like he has a final bit with um, Mel Gibson at the end of the fourth one where he talks about Froggy, and I, I must have seen it when it came out, because I, I remember the Froggy thing, but he talks about, you know, it doesn't have to, 
your love, your new love doesn't have to be better than your old love. Um, and that's okay. You just, you know, it's mm -hmm. okay to have love in your life. Something along those lines. And mm -hmm. he, he kind of does it without doing the Leo Getz voice. He just sort of does the, he just does the monologue. And it's great. And it's, you know, it's one of the, it, like, you shouldn't cry during these Lethal Weapon movies. But that one kind of brought a tear to my eye. It was really sweet. And, you know, Mar you know, Mel Gibson's reaction to it is really, really good. So anyway, I love Joe Pesci in the second one. He's fucking hilarious. Some of the stuff that he does, you know, the, the, the okay, okay, okay. You know, throughout the whole goddamn movie. Um, that's all good stuff. And then my favorite thing, and I'll let you give your thoughts on Lethal Weapon 2, and then we'll move on. Diplomatic mm -hmm. unity. The whole, I don't think what people realize about Lethal Weapon and is, is how embedded the gags and bits in these movies is embedded in, in like the culture of action filmmaking because that diplomatic immunity thing was everywhere for a while. Like every villain was doing something like the diplomatic immunity line. And it's so it was a plot point. It was a plot point in death in the family. That yeah. was how the Joker, that was how the Joker got away with Batman, not snapping his neck like a Pocky. <laughs> He he became he became like the um the um diplomatic envoy from mm -hmm. like United Arab Emirates. That's right. I remember the Libya panel now with the turban on his head. Look at the fucking iron cheek. It's the most absurd fucking thing. Mm -hmm. History making arc, and one of the things people are gonna remember it most for is Joker in a turban. <laughs> yup. Um, but yeah, I uh, I love the diplomatic immunity line. He says it twice, and it's so good. It's like he's a, you know, because again, Lethal Weapon is one of those things where I think people acknowledge it exists. I don't think people realize how important it is to the culture of movie making. Um, but that villain is one of the best villains in like action movie history. He's so good. It's a it's a it's a great little story. What do you think of Lethal Weapon too? Well. First of all, as far as Pesci goes, I realized something about him that I finally know how to kind of how to crystallize and explain this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain performers in media that have certain very particular mannerisms that they just pull it off effortlessly and it is undeniably cool as hell. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about things like Mick Jagger's dancing. Yeah. Um, Chester Bennington's voice, um, uh, especially on a lot of her on a lot of early Lincoln Park. Um, Christopher Walken and William Shatner's, shall we say, distinctive uh, vocal mannerisms, or as I just pretty much did it, Jeff fucking Goldblum. Um, and Pesci kind of has kind of has that, too. But the amazing thing about that is there are these certain performers who do certain things and they do it and it's cool as the other side of the pillow. But then you watch somebody else, anybody else, try to do the same thing. Try to sing a, a Linkin Park song the way Chester does. It sounds fucking awful. <laughs> um, uh, someone, you know, Walken does his, his unique speech pattern thing and is able to weave it seamlessly into just about any role he plays, and, and, and you can't object to it. You yeah, haven't huh? watched Up His Ass. Yeah. Um, but then somebody else does it, and it's just somebody else's hammy Christopher Walken. It's kind of like how Cody Rhodes once complained, everybody's got a Dusty Rhodes impression, yeah. and I don't want to hear them anymore. Um, yeah, that's kind of what blame him. Has. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of what Pesci has. Pesci has that very distinct personality that you'll find in so many of the roles that he's played, but it's never quite exactly the same flavor. Mm -hmm. He's able to kind of, he's, he is the man who becomes whatever room he is in at the time. Mm -hmm. He's able to tweak that just a little bit to suit whatever the role happens to be so that, you know, William Shatner shows up in a role now, does the thing. You're, you know, you're just pretty much watching William Shatner be a William Shatner trope because William Shatner. I'm giggling because I'm just picturing Joe Pesci in Casino where he meets, uh, it's later in the movie, he meets De Niro in the desert and he just gets out of the car. He's barely out of the car. Where the fuck do you get off? I, it's like every time I watch that line 
And like he was like, why are you making a big deal about that? I don't know. There's something about the way he delivers that line. Like he doesn't he's barely out of the car and he is already down De Niro's throat. It's awesome. Yeah, but you see, but again, but his performances in My Cousin Vinny are a little bit mm-hmm. different from Lethal from Lethal Weapon, which is no which is yeah. massive, which is a world apart from Harry and Home Alone, which couldn't be further from Billy Bats and good in Goodfellas, right? And so on and, and so on and so forth. It's like if you were to grow up only having experienced the fucking good feathers sketch, and someone <laughs> told and someone told you that's supposed to be some cat named Joe Pesci, you're gonna grow up thinking that thinking that was all the range he ever had as an actor. And right. brother, could you not be further off? And That's to right. kind of close out, and to kind of close it out, I just got to say, it's a lesser script. It's a lesser script that that completely, as so many do, managed to miss so many of the key elements that made the first one so eminently enjoyable. And yet, and yet, like, like Clyde Frazier and Pearl Monroe, just the chemistry is there between between Danny and Mel. It, it, it's like Dave Grohl and Taylor Hawkins or Pat Smear. Um, it, it's like Montana and Rice, Mahomes and Kelsey. Just no matter no matter what else is happening around them, they can somehow fall back on that natural innate chemistry and still manage to pull off something that is just fun as all hell, despite not exactly being a highlight of the four movies. Um, okay, so the next one, Lethal Weapon 3, comes out in 1998. It's made on a budget of $35 million. It makes 300 See, going all the way up, like one of the best success stories in filmmaking, um, $321.7 million. Like, people are just in love with this series. Joe Pesci's back. This is the one that introduces Rene Russo. Um, the story is... As Murta, who is one week from retiring a rigs investigative robbery committed using a duplicate armored car, they find themselves in the middle of an internal affairs investigation led by Sergeant Lorna Cole, who is Rene Russo. With assistance from Leo, they learn that the subject of the investigation is a rogue cop who is stealing impounded weapons and selling them on the black market. During the investigation, Murta shoots and kills a teenager who attacks him and Riggs. He turns out to be a friend of his own son. This prompts Murta to capture the man responsible for the distribution of illegal firearms and rethink his retirement. Um... I love Lethal Weapon 3 for two reasons. One, I like, you know, the the fight that the two have about, like, what is Riggs supposed to do without Murtaugh when Murtaugh retires? And, um, you know, it's 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 easy to, especially if you don't really, if you really don't care about, you know, you're just looking for some passive entertainment to focus on the action of the story. But for me, the real winning element of, Lethal Weapon 3 is that struggle between Riggs and Murtaugh over whether or not Murtaugh should retire. It's great. It's so layered. Um, I don't think Lethal the Lethal Weapon movies get the credit they deserve for the for the writing, the subtext in these movies. And this is a great example of it. Because on the one hand, and again, the Gemini, I can see both sides of every argument in this whole affair. Murtaugh is absolutely entitled to his retirement. Especially with everything Riggs put, has put him through in the last few years. Oh, yeah. You know, everything that happened to his family, everything that happened to the poor man's house. Um, uh, he is absolutely entitled to say, I have done my bit for God and country, and now it is time for me to walk into the woods to live deliberately. It's a lot of things I just smashed together. Um, <laughs> kids smash action figures, I smash sayings. Um, but and- we, only needed, we only needed a more dinosaurs, and I would have had a bingo. I have to tell you something at the end of the show about more dinosaurs, but um, so the point being, like he he it's he's absolutely owed that right to retire and live with his family in peace and go fishing and go travel on his boat and do whatever it is he wants to do. And there's something to the effect of like you know Riggs at this point has had plenty of years to grieve, mourn, process, get over, and move on with his life. And yet he's still enmeshed with this guy's with this guy and his family. Um, and the fact that, you know, but by the same token, they have a relationship with each other. Yes, they are partners, but you know, you don't not every relationship has to be romantic. And just because it's not romantic doesn't mean it's not valuable, it's not weighty. And this relationship between these two brothers is very weighty. And that's Mel Gibson's point. He's like, 
your decisions affect me. Your decisions affect us. And you're not taking me or us into, you know, into your decision making. You're only thinking about yourself. And he's not wrong. You know, imagine you're with your partner, romantic or otherwise, and you're just doing everything for yourself and you're not thinking about the other person, how that's going to make that person feel, how not like a person that makes them feel, it makes them feel like you're an appendage in, in their life and not an actual person. Certainly don't feel like a partner in those circumstances. And that's Mel Gibson's point. Um, but by the same token, like I said, at this point, he should also, you know, recognize Danny Glover's Murtaugh's, uh, right to move on with his life and do the and, and do the things you need to do to process and move on enter renee russo which goes back to the first two movies about you know he's kind of a black widow character and he is afraid to love because everything he loves dies you know he's pete still everything i love is dead um and so him and renee russo start to form a partnership they start to uh have a bond and because they are because one has a penis and the other has a vagina they have to be in love by the end of the movie um because that's how that goes but he he is very much like he, he obviously finds renee russo attractive and she is an attractive woman uh but he's afraid to love her because the last chick he tried to love ended up in the drink and died and the girl before that was his wife that he, you know, was going to kill himself about. So there's just a lot going on in Lethal Weapon 3. And I think it's handled pretty well for a movie that has some of the dirt silliest Fast and Furious post four action scenes I have seen in movies. I mean, like the action sequence, first of all, that whole bit at the beginning where they, where he tries to, where he says, fuck the bomb squad and tries to defuse the bomb and it blows up an entire building. Look, I don't want to be that guy, but they they had they to put him in prison. <laughs> they don't demote oh, yeah. you. Yeah. They don't demote you for that. You you go on a terrorist watch list and then you end up in a hole in Guantanamo Bay. Get the fuck out of here. But we're we're having fun, so it's okay to blow up a building. <laughs> um, that bit was already messed up. <laughs> they bring back Joe Pesci and they do more Joe Pesci stuff with him. This one he's a realist, he's a realtor. And there's an ongoing gag with uh, Murtaugh's house where he keeps trying to sell it, but it's, it's you know it's got termites, it's got ghosts, it's you know it's this, this poltergeist living in there that's pulling children through a television. Everything is happening in this house. They can't sell it for shit. Then they do sell it, and he decides he's not selling it because he's not retiring. <laughs> Poor Joe Pesci. What do you think of Lethal Weapon Three? Not bad, not bad at all. Um. My favorite, my favorite character bit with Murtaugh, or not Murtaugh, mm -hmm. Riggs. I'm sorry, Riggs. Um, and I don't even know if this is something that is supposed to be interpreted this way, but it's just the way it struck me. Um, do you remember the the shooting range scene? Yeah, where they're where, where they're kind of demoing the armor the armor piercing rounds. Yes, you see Riggs in that setting, and if you followed him through three movies. It's it's astounding to think that that's the same that's the same guy, yeah. From the from the from the original Lethal Weapon, the the one who the one who just wanted an ending, he just couldn't pull the trigger himself. Right. It's I like it because it's such a sign of how much he's grown. Yeah. Over the course of all these, yes, he yes he may still have a rec a, a brave reckless spirit. And he may play he may play fast and lose and he still gets results. But the fact is, in that moment, he's being he's being articulate, he's being analytic, he's he's coming across and explain and explaining things to his to his peers. Well, yeah, he's being he's being a he's being a true professional. Um it's nice, and I would even say it kind of points to a certain spirit of these four movies. That makes me go, well, no wonder this became a TV show. Because yeah. not that not that Murtaugh is an unimportant part of the story or Danny Glover's unimportant to the franchise. Obviously, couldn't be further from the truth. But by this point, it very much feels like Riggs story more than more than anything else. Because if we're to look at it as sort of 
Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, mm -hmm. so to speak. He's the one who's really taking the bulk of those the bulk of those steps himself. Sure. Um, and and kind of going through the worst the worst of it to to come out a changed man in the end. Let me tell you um, how Danny Glover kind of gets Homer Simpson's disease by the fourth one, where like yeah, okay. he started. He he's just exhausted in the first one. By the fourth one, he's kind of dumb. <laughs> it's like, and it's a it's a progression over time. And I'm like, like I don't know how we got to that interpretation of this character, but that's that's. What, but you're not wrong. This is this is very yeah. much the rig story. Yeah, and and even even Pesci getting to getting to mm -hmm. kind of go straight and trying to make a real go of it is it, it is plenty charming. He reminded me a little bit of some of my favorite anime and manga characters. <laughs> Mm -hmm. the, that have, that have kind of been fleshed out that way, but um, no, we're three movies in. This is about the point when, if franchises aren't about to go off, aren't about to go off the cliff, um, the engine has at the very least thrown a rod, um, or the brake line has blown, or or something like that. Um, and here, three movies in everything is actually kind of still clicking. Yeah. It, I, I said it before. It bears repeating, especially now that we have people watching. Hello, people on Twitter. Um, Hi, everybody. X. Um, it's one of the few franchises that truly stands apart from almost anything that we've talked about in like the 10 plus years we've been discussing movie franchises because this is the long road to ruin after all, not the metal hammer of doom after all. And sorry, that's a Jesse joke from way back when, um, where we were doing the covers competition and he kept throwing it to Robert just to, just to get my goat, Robert Cooper. And he was like, this is the metal hammer of doom after all. I'm like, oh, here it goes. This is the long road to ruin. And <laughs> the most common thing that we talk about in the long road to ruin, hence the name of the podcast, not just because we like the Foo Fighters, is that most franchises fall off by the end. They, they, we have yeah. more dinosaurs, we have more stupidity, we have more, 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 but we end up with less, less, less. And Lethal Weapon stands apart as one of the few franchises we've ever talked about that that is solid from beginning to end, <laughs> with no drop. -off. Even the show was good. Was it? I never watched it. It was pretty the, good. Okay. It was all right. It, it just, if I recall correctly, I think, um, I think it just kind of ran into a wall because I, I think... A member of the cast was rather naughty. Oh, <laughs> you get canceled. Yeah. yeah um, but but yeah, I've, as, as far as I can remember, and by all by all means, anybody who wants to feel free to roast me and correct me on this. Uh, the way I remember it, it was actually doing all right when it got the plug pulled. I think it like th it went three seasons, for what that's worth. Um, which for which for you know what any network show nowadays that ain't bad. I no. mean, that like like seven is six or seven seasons is old is old age. You get at you get past seven, you're the Strom fucking Thurmond of the airwaves. I love her name Russo in this movie, and I'm I'm usually the first person that's just like, oh my god, you know why why is every woman fucking Arnold Schwarzenegger and Commando in these movies? But I think Renee Russo earns her ass kicking credentials in these um she has a few kind of ridiculous she can take out a mob of five guys but i think if you just sort of buy that these five guys are not ninjas they're just you know hulking brutes and she's a martial artist you know in the uh in the art of being able to protect yourself and is a proficient knowledgeable fighter if you sort of take that as red, then you can buy that she can kind of hold her own. And, and I'll tell you what, uh, between the third and the fourth, well, it was really just the third one, because she's pregnant in the fourth one. Um, in the third one, like she takes a good beating in some of these scenes. She just comes out ahead. And I it's not bad. Um, given the given what we see now with the, what they do with women where they're infallible, you know, goddess uh boss chicks that can't do any wrong. And nothing ever bad happens to him. Uh, which Hollywood thoroughly uninteresting. Make stuff happen to women. We like that sort of thing, you know, real people. Um, I think they do a good job with Renee Russo of making at least her fighting scenes quasi believable. And I'll tell you what, she's a long legged woman. Her legs go all the way up to her waist, like like Stacey Keebler. And she throws a mean kick. 
Like, they, it's not bad. I mean, I'm sure if they were in an Andrew Graham here or, or Robert Wahinfrey, um, they would, you know, be like, ah, I've seen people kick, and that's not a kick. I'll show you a kick, and they beat me, in the, you know, and whatever. Uh, my point is, from a purely aesthetic point of view, I enjoy Ray, uh, Rene Russo kicking things. You know, she's no, she's no Patrick Swayze, who was a dancer's grace, but it was still good stuff. Um, last word on Lethal Weapon 3, then we're moving on. Um, shockingly, shockingly good. Um, it's the lethal weapon two was, was okay for, for what it was mm -hmm. lethal weapon three. I actually genuinely unabashed, unabashedly enjoyed. Yeah. All right. Lethal weapon four comes out in 1998. And it is made on a budget of they went all in with this one. Uh the 150 million and it was not profitable. It only made 284.4. So this one's a, a drop off. This one introduces Chris Chris Rock. The villain is Jet Lee. And can I tell you just before I read the the plot synopsis here in the wiki page, how Jet Lee does not have any bones. Jet Lee is all rubber. I mean, he's awesome. But that man bends in ways that are not human. And I'll tell you what, I'm not the world's biggest fan of Jet Li movies. Not to say that I don't like them. It's to say that I don't watch them. Because you know me, Sean. You've been doing this with me a long time. And what do I always say? I don't find Kung Fu, Kung Fu movies to be particularly interesting. So for those of you that are just like, no, no. And that Jet still Li astounds me. <laughs> it's, it's, sorry, I am what I am. Um, but for those of you who have watched every Jet Li movie ever and know how amazing he is... I'll tell you this, just based on his Lethal Weapon 4 performance, that man has presence, that man has vib, he has verve, he has it all. I could I could watch Jet Li do any genre of movie based on his performance in Lethal Weapon 4 and occasionally watch him Damn. kick things, kick things, but only the one where he can kick you in the face by bending his leg over his head. I don't know how the fuck he does it. Like, they should have cast him as Mr. Fantastic. He has natural stretching ability. It's amazing. Jet Li is a revelation, a physical revelation in this movie. And give him all the flowers. He's awesome. Um, I should watch more. You don't need to convince me. I should watch more Jet Li movies. He's awesome. Lethal Weapon 4 already did that for you. <laughs> I, could, I need to go back and watch more Jet Li. He's pretty cool. Um, in any case, that said. Lethal Weapon 4, with his girlfriend Lana and Murtaugh's daughter Rian uh, are both pregnant. Riggs again teams up with Murtaugh and Leo, as well as rookie detective Lee Butters, who, who this apparently was written by my alternate universe, uh, Mark Radledge, because they keep calling him a different name, um, to investigate a Chinese immigrant <laughs> smuggling ring. Wa Sing Ku is a ruthless enforcer who attempts to murder Murtaugh's family by burning them alive like you do in their home. Murtaugh discovers that Butters is the father of his daughter's unborn child. The two kill dozens of Chinese gangsters and catch up with the boss of the smuggling ring. Riggs and Lorna are married at the end of the film by a rabbi, Mazel Tov, as their child is born. Um, I vaguely remembered, remember this. Like I said, I kind of remember maybe some of the Jet Li stuff. Can I just say, also, that, that finale sequence where they stab Jet Li with a pipe and he's still actively fighting them as if like being stabbed in the gut wouldn't cause you, you know, cause you some, such severe pain and shock you wouldn't be able to move. No, Jet Li's just like, fuck that. Like he's a goddamn cyborg. I was like, I've seen a lot of unbelievable stuff in these movies, but this stretches credulity so badly, it took me out of the movie. It's it's way dumb, Sean. I, I hate to be that guy. And now it's second time I've said that in the podcast. That's a little over an hour long. But I'm watching this, and I'm like, I have seen these motherfuckers blow up buildings, have car chases that have killed thousands of people. Um, just They've shot up everybody in Los Angeles. We're living in Mad Max times. But a pipe through this guy's gut as he's waving them around, and this guy's still kicking them. Jet Li is still kicking them with a pipe in his gut. And I'm like, uh, you know, mm, maybe, you know, re metal rebar instead of pipe, but whatever. Um, it's bullshit. <laughs> and it's like, come on, man, this is way dumb. It is. It is. I um I should never be made to root against a man as beautiful as Jet Li. Mm -hmm. 
uh, that just that, that that just hurts my heart that, that I have to root against him. <laughs> Why you do this to me, Long Road to Ruin? <laughs> um, he is um, he is absolutely fantastic. Um, I would say this is this is right up there with his work, right up alongside the one. Um, mm-hmm. probably among some among some of my favorites. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of Chris Rock's acting. Um, Chris Rock's acts like he's still doing stand up. Exactly, exactly. Because the fact is, he does it, and honestly. I don't know if he knows he does it and just doesn't care or if he's just that unoriginal that he starts plagiarizing himself. Okay. I don't want to interrupt he'll take you, the, he'll, but I got, I got to throw in this because, because this is, I have to address this so that you can talk about it. Two things about Chris Rock. One, he has a, his jaw structure and overbite never go away. He always has that Cheshire smile. To the point where he does a joke about, like, I think it's a brother-in-law that he has about how, like, um, you know, the guy smokes crack, but he doesn't need pork because pork will kill you. You know, and does that, for those listening on audio, like, I just did kind of a toothy grin. It's a big part of his stand-up routine, too. The problem is throughout this movie, he's constantly doing that. So, like, I don't know if that's just a jaw structure thing or, like, he's just, like, a permanent overbite. I don't know what it is, but, like... Chris Rock never looks fucking natural. And here's the thing. I've seen him in Spiral where he wasn't doing shtick and he wasn't doing that. So I'm wondering if it was just like that's what Donner wanted from him or he didn't know any better to not do it. And Donner didn't know any better to stop. Like, I don't know if Donner was like, could you please put your fucking jaw away? We're trying to make a movie here, pal. I'm not entirely sure where the disconnect was, but it's 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 faker than a three dollar bill. That's my problem with Chris Rock in this movie. Jim. I know what you mean, and Jim Carrey does it, but he does it with a very kind of deliberate, um, with something deliberate in mind for whatever character, for whatever scene he's scene he's doing. That's mm-hmm. his whole thing. Um, like, but he's also proven that he knows when to do it and when not to do it. It's kind of like when Robin Williams kind of knew when to take the energy down just a, yeah. just a little bit. I don't know if, I don't know if it's one of those things where Chris doesn't have that understanding of when to, of when to take it down a gear or if he just doesn't care and just, that it just thinks it's always the thing for him to do because it's the same thing when I think when he improvs a lot of scenes and he does it in so many movies where he will just, it, it's not even like he's alluding to it mm-hmm. in numerous movies. It, it's outright cribs from his routines, from his, from his books. I want to throw a parallel at you because I think this is Donner's fault. The more, the more we're talking about it and the more I'm starting to think about um, Richard Donner and Richard Pryor in Superman 3, the more I'm realizing, I don't think this is Chris Rock's fault. Because while I, while I again, I can point to his jaw line and, you know, his overbite, um, he doesn't do that in other movies. Like, whatever it is, it's, it's, it's controlled. And everything else I've seen him in, now that I'm thinking about it. But if watch Richard Donner and Richard Donner's direction with Richard Pryor in Superman 3, where he's just letting Richard Pryor do shtick. And I have a sneaky, sneaky suspicion Richard Donner's like approach to put black comedian in my action comedy is, well, you got famous because of your stand-up, so just do your stand-up. Like, Richard Donner, that's why I want to do, I, 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 we'll talk about it after the show, but I really want to do like a Richard Donner triple feature because this man needs to be studied more, which is a weird thing to say about the guy who gave us Superman 3 in these movies. But I have a sneaky suspicion, like, Richard Donner is like an artist, but not a deep thinker. And he's just kind of coming at mm-hmm. things like, you know, Joe Lunchpail. And, and Joe Lunchpail thinks, well, well, Chris Rock is a, is a stand-up guy. So just let him do stand-up. That's what the people want. You know who I realize he reminds me of? 
Who, Chris and Parker I mean this Donner. in a very, in a very, uh, uh, no, uh, Richard Donner. Okay. Um, he reminds me in a very complimentary way of Robert Rodriguez, both in the fact that his best movies are made on extremely reasonable budgets, mm -hmm. but also the fact that there's very little pretense in anything that he does. He may want his movies to be a certain way. He may have mm -hmm. a very specific vision, but at the end of the day, he's making, he's making art because he loves making, because he loves making art. It doesn't mean he's doing anything weird. It's just mean he's just kind of making something that he would want, that he would want to see and just throwing his everything behind that. You know, I was thinking when you compared him to Robert Rodriguez, my first thought was, and again, I don't always like to cut you off. So sometimes I'll just think things, but I won't, I'll, I won't say them out loud. I get it. But my, but my first it. thought was, yeah, but Robert Rod Rodriguez has an aesthetic. And then I took a beat while you were talking and I was like, well, no, Richard Donner has an aesthetic too. It's just his, his aesthetic is not cultural, it's mental. The Richard Donner aesthetic is ADHD. His movies are busy as fuck. They're like the living embodiment of a crowded street. There's a lot happening in a Richard Donner movie. And with... Di yeah, like, you're right. And I'm wondering if, like, Richard Donner was just way ahead of his time, like 20 years ahead. Because come with me on my little journey here. I'm just going to take you for a walk around the block. Uh, stand ahead. and leave you in the bushes. No. Um, is, uh... <laughs> Everybody got to die of something. Um... When you think about like the TikTok and YouTube generation of people with no attention spans, if you don't mm -hmm. capture them with a lot of jingling keys and bright colors and unicorns, you're going to lose them. And you've only got maybe three to ten seconds to grab them. Isn't Richard Donner then the perfect director for the modern age? Because his movies are like are busy and crowded and there's and they're like the TNA backstage interview segment. <laughs> like there's so much going on in a Richard Donner film that I think even like the most ADHD adult brain amongst us would find something to latch onto and be interested in because it is constant movement. He's like the opposite of Wes Anderson. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wes, so. what, what, one of the things about Wes that I picked up on very early on mm. is he always has just a little something innocuous yeah. going on that someone will be selling hot dogs. Someone might be sweeping the street. Someone might be teaching their dog tricks, whatever, but there's always a little something going on mm -hmm. in the background. Um, Richard Donner is more like, um, who was it? Uh, the artist who did, um, JLA Titans, the Technus Imperative. Um, Phil Jimenez. Um, I remember hearing once out of Phil Jimenez that he's at his best when he is just filling pages with as many characters as possible and giving them all something meaningful to do. That's kind of how a Richard Donner movie feels. I'm it's kind of so. like a double page Phil Jimenez spread where there's a shit ton going on. But it's all done so well that you kind of want to go back and just pay attention to some, but something else on a repeat viewing mm -hmm. just so you can catch something new. So Lethal Weapon 4, um, it's a fun movie. I, it, it takes Riggs to the end of his journey. He has found love. He has a child. He is um, repaired from the damage of the loss of his wife. Um, you know, he has this found the final picture of of this large family that involves now Chris Rock and Joe Pesci and Rene Russo is a really nice way of ending the movie. Like I I've heard there's a fifth one in production and I was like, no, it ended fine the way it was. Leave it alone. Please just God, leave this no. fucking thing alone. No, you had no, a television no, show. No, 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 no. Don't, we don't need a fifth one of these when, you know, Mel Gibson, who is a hundred and his reputation is fucking ruined. And Danny Glover and Danny Glover, who was I think, dead at this point. You know, and it's become a tree somewhere in the forest. Like, like we're like we're done here, people. Stop already. <laughs> we don't need another fucking lethal weapon movie. Um, it's okay for things to end. Ugh. Um, but I like this movie. Uh, it's a shame it didn't make as much money as its predecessors. But 
Um, I'll give you the final word here because I don't have a whole lot to say much more about it. It's a fun little story. Uh, they look like they're having a... It, this is another one where it deals with an actor kind of like uh, Shatner in Star Trek 2 where you know they're coming face to face with the fact that they are getting older. Um, something I can definitely relate to. Things hurt. It's harder to do stuff. You heal slower. Um, and, you know, and there's that for, for three movies, Mel Gibson got to be the young chippy and Danny Glover got to be the old master. And there and there is and there is Mel Gibson in this fourth movie going, I don't know what to do with with being old. And Danny Glover goes, come with me because I have experience in this sort of thing. And it's great. I love it. Um, and like I said before, Joe Pesci's last little bit with uh, Mel Gibson about, you know, it's OK. It's OK to love someone else besides your dead wife. It's It's really OK. You deserve love too, and it's a sweet moment. You know, all of it's really, really good. Um, so that's my thought on Lethal Weapon Four. What's yours? Really, it's it's the ultimate counter argument to the idea that box office, that the bottom line, is the definitive indicator of quality. Because, yeah, as you said, Lethal Weapon Four did not do great business. It, it, and yes, I'll concede that it's arguably the the weakest, the least interesting of the of the four. But does that mean it's a weak movie? No, far from it. There's a lot to like here. Um, it's just a shame that it was past the point where the franchise was really at the height of its power, and I think a lot of people even cared about a fourth Lethal Weapon movie. Um, it was certainly when Mel had outgrown just playing just playing Riggs long past when Danny Glover was just Murtaugh. Um it starts to feel like the di- <clears throat> it starts to feel like the Die Hard franchise. You're just inventing yes. reasons for these guys to go on an adventure, and yes. people <clears throat> people get tired of it. Um, you're not doing anything new, with, you're not really doing anything new with this series. Um, and so while there's good stuff here, I just said what it was by the same token, but that's, that's also us examining this. I think for the average ham and Eger, I think they're struggling with, why are we watching a fourth one of these? Didn't we say all we needed to say with the first three? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the TV series was just, was just a nice way to, I think, just have one last thing with the lethal weapon name on it that actually did justice to the franchise, but please, please no fifth movie um i i don't think anybody is going to want is going to want to see mel gibson at this point in anything resembling a kind of heroic role um that danny glover i think should never be made to say the too old for this shit line ever again he he's kind of had it thrust upon him so many times since the first fucking movie uh but you know, these four all together, r- good to great watches, all of them. There's no such thing as a waste of your time among them. The second is a little bit of an endurance trial. Um, <laughs> diplomatic but then, immunity. What did you say? I said oh, diplomatic no, no. immunity. But even then, it's still it's still at least entertaining. Three is better than it has any right being. Four is just a nice curtain call for everything. And, of course, number one, and I would kind of leave it on this thought for you to expound on yourself Mm -hmm. Um, because it goes back to a conversation that I had many moons ago with our good pal Cole Marentet, the film twit, about comics. Um, I was talking about how... Honestly, I've never quite gotten as into Watchmen as a lot of people have. The show, and or the, I was um, talking about the, the HBO show. Well, I haven't watched the HBO show yet, uh, okay. but I've read the comic and I've seen the movie. Okay. And as I told Cole, I said it's be it's because I I can't stand it when comics kind of go this hard and over the top to portray heroes as being secretly horrible human horrible human beings it it smacks of trying way too hard and thinking you found 
you found it. Yeah. Like, it's it's the reason it's the reason why I can't be arsed to sit down and watch the boys because every time leading up to it that I heard someone describe a scene from the boys that they hoped was in the show, I kid I'm only about ninety per, I'm only about ten percent joking here. I had to check to see if someone was just playing a game of the aristocrats. Um, Two things. One, because it was all, it was all just getting more and more absurd. But then Cole kind of, and I'll let you this in a second. Yeah. But Cole kind of explained to me that the reason to set Watchmen apart is when you've been deluged long enough with the imitators of something that was an innovator, it's way too easy to take the innovator and lump it in there and all of a sudden miss everything that made that special. That's what, that's kind of what it's like if you've watched a lot of buddy cop movies and then you go back and watch lethal weapon, your first thought is going to be, well, shit, this is just nothing but a string of the typical cliches that everyone complains about. But then you go back and remember that at the time this came out, there hadn't been anything yeah. quite like lethal weapon in a lot of, this was really lightning in a bottle. This was this was the uh, well again maybe not the originator necessarily but it's the measuring stick it's the one that set the standard that all the other movies that ran these cliches into the ground tried to live up to. Um, one, watch the Watchmen HBO series; it's phenomenal, and it's yes, really nothing like to. the comic book movie. Uh, also, yeah. The Boys is awesome too. But to sympathize with your point, this is why half the people we know in the Rattle of the Broadcasting Network can't stand Garth Ennis. Like, they're just like, they don't like the fact that Garth Ennis is a, a take on superheroes is that they suck. And they should be deconstructed and destroyed. So, all right. Uh, well, folks, that is... <laughs> All your stuff should be deconstructed and destroyed is the phrase that pays here on the Rattle and Broadcasting Network. All your deconstructed stuff are belong to us. So that is our review of the Lethal Weapon franchise. Um, you know what, Sean? You and I said at the beginning of this, hey, like, let's not, because I, I, I have things I need to do. I don't want to be here forever. This is four <laughs> movies, and I still have PTSD. 90 from... <laughs> minutes later. Yeah, I still have PTSD from fucking Superman. So, um... You know, I, I so coming out right out of the box and saying, let's just talk as friends. We don't need to examine every bullet point of these fucking movies. And I had a really enjoyable talk here. I mean, we went 90 minutes, but that's okay. Um, this was it was a quick 90 minutes, and I just enjoyed I think I have having learned from some of our friends that maybe not everything needs, you know, a uh, excruciatingly acute dissection. And sometimes it's just fun to talk about your movies for you know for 10. 20 30 minutes and you know and then move on to the next fucking thing it's probably not a bad format so i'm glad we did this and i'm glad that we finally got the lethal weapon franchise done and i don't have to re-air the one i did with chris evans so i'm i'm happy i had a random i had a random question for you go ahead okay um you enjoyed the movie creed right i the, loved it yeah the, so, yeah okay um you ever notice something a little bit funny going on during the final fight scene between rounds when the doc is checking Donnie's eye to see if he can keep going and he does the old finger test? I believe you that it's there. It's been a while since I've seen the first one. Okay. If you watch the movie again, mm -hmm. pay very close attention to that scene because Stitch helps him cheat the test. Okay. I didn't notice it until last until last night. But this is this is such a nice poetic little thing. And and hang on, I'm gonna go on a little on a little mini ramp, but I'll try to keep it reasonable. Um during the scene, and, and I double checked, I went back and watched it a couple times to make absolutely sure because I thought maybe for a second it might have been Rocky's hand that was there on the back of his head, but then mm -hmm. I realized Rocky's not wearing gloves and Stitch has his you know surgical gloves on. Um when they go to that scene there are moments where the ref is holding up his is holding up his fingers they and they cut to a shot over Donnie's shoulder and uh -huh. you see a gloved hand on the back of his head if you watch carefully Donnie how many fingers am I holding up and on the back of his head like okay. tell him, two how many now four 
Okay, he can go. And the reason I say that's poetic is because, you know, Stitch, a, a cut man, gets to see just the absolute most brutal damage that people will wring their bodies through in pursuit of a dream. Mm-hmm. And he has seen not just the physical toll, but the emotional toll this journey has taken Adonis on. And he knows that that the last thing in the world he wants is to have this end with a doctor stoppage, with a doctor telling him, no, you're beaten so badly you can't go on. And so he's going against his better judgment and giving him the opportunity to see the end of this him end of this himself and write it and write his own ending. Because he does not want to leave it in anybody else's hands but his. That is fucking beautiful. Very good. All right. Uh, yesterday, speaking of beautiful, myself, Chris Owen from Movies That Don't Suck and Some That Do, and Robert and I discussed Civil War. Uh, check out that review. Tomorrow, Ronnie Adams is threatening to do a uh, review of Fallout on Amazon Prime. Uh, Pat may or may not be there. I think Adam from the screen, from his old Screaming Away podcast co-host uh, is supposed to be on it. So we'll see. I'll find out when I get back from Dirty Trivia. Um no show Thursday. I've got naked swimming to do. Um, yay! Yay! Naked. <laughs> naked swimming. However, we are going to do a show Friday. Another long road to ruin, but this time it's me and Chris Bailey, Chris Bailey, Chris Bailey. Um, we are looking at the Flintstone movies. The Flintstones and then Viva Rock Ve- Vegas, which we decided was got, which the devil's payment for uh, whatever deal you made with the devil. What an awful movie that is, but we're going to talk about it. Me and Chris Bailey. Um, next week on the Rattles and Broadcasting Network, we've got uh, Abigail on Damn You Hollywood. Uh, myself and Alexis will be talking Resident Alien Season 3, uh, No Show Wednesday at the moment. And then myself, Pat Mullen, and Ronnie Adams will be doing the second half of our Schools in Crisis uh, series. This one's the fun one. We did the serious one. Now it's time for dessert, as they said. We're looking at the substitute, the principal, and 187, yo. So that's what's going on here on the Rattle and Broadcasting Network. Uh, also, and I, I haven't been plugging it, but I should. If you go on the W2M Network YouTube page, I've shot my first music video. Yes. Uh, Chris Bailey went on a rant in our group chat about how he no longer gives a fuck about my opinion or anyone else's. He just wants to enjoy the stuff he likes. And I thought this was such a great... Oh, yeah. This, I it, it's hope great. he's okay. He's awesome. He's normally such a happy-go-lucky guy. No, this was a great rant, Sean. This was this was one of the more epic rants I've ever seen him do. And I was so okay. I was so happy with this rant that I made Jesse take the rant and put it into Chat GPT and then Suno and generate a song set to a pirate shanty, which he did. And it's called Worthless Opinions. And Worthless Opinions is so good that I shot a music video with my children. Oh, amazing! Oh yeah, Sean, we're done here. Take a minute before you go back to your life and go on go on the W2M Network YouTube page, and it's right there. It's right in the regular list of videos. It's from I I think I posted it Saturday. I literally like like it like a real music music director had a shot list and everything, plotted out and shot my kids, um, for this worthless opinions uh song. And it's awesome. It was an interesting experience. Hey, I learned something about myself during this. I really like directing. I, I like formulating, producing, directing. I don't really like writing as like the actual art of writing it out. I need somebody else for that. I need a screenwriter. But plotting it out, storyboarding things, I really enjoy directing people. I think it's my favorite thing to do behind the camera. Um, you know what I don't like doing? Editing. I, <laughs> I learned that about myself that. Editing pulling a slog. Pulling a clip out for TikTok is one thing. Actually, like editing and getting and putting in different shots and that sort of stuff. I'm like, I, I need to be Peter Jackson. I need to be fat and on the couch and shoeless. And I need to have an editor, maybe a woman <laughs> sitting at the editing bay, and we just decide what we're gonna do to make this movie happen. Um, so that's what I learned. Anyway, show us what you pissed from, Sean. Well, first. I finally just have to ask a question. Yes. Where does Chris Bailey, Chris Bailey, Chris Bailey come from? Newfoundland. Da ha 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 ha. No, I'm referring to the to the very specific introduction of Chris Bailey, Chris Bailey, Chris Bailey. Oh, that. Okay. Um, that is me not letting go of a very specific thing that happened on a podcast. So there used to be two Chris's. There was Chris Bailey and Christian. And I remember Christian, yeah. 
and Chris and uh, Jesse kept mixing them up. He was calling Bailey Sheen and Sheen Bailey. And so finally, to sort of set his brain straight, he goes, Chris Bailey, Chris Bailey, Chris Bailey. And because I may, <laughs> dog with a bone, beating dead horses, redundant, I even repeat myself, I haven't let it go. So he's forever Chris Bailey, Chris Bailey, Chris Bailey. Oh, that's amazing. I love that. Yeah. All right, Sean. Dare I, dare, dare I even ask where show us where you pissed from comes from? TikTok. Yeah, I buy that. There was a uh, there was a guy. I, I it's since gone, and because again, it's me, so I can't let anything go. But there was a guy. He put a song on TikTok, and everyone was using it for a sound. And it was like, show us where you pissed from. Show us where you pissed from. I can't remember the lyrics to it, but it had a few. It had a few goes around. And it was pretty funny, and everyone was using it for a sound for a while. So if, you, if you'd like to All start right. a new one, here's one that's currently popular. All right, Sean, say the weird thing. Oh, that one. Yeah, I like that one. <laughs> that one's good. People are desperately seeking realness. <laughs> All right. Um... Well, I guess in I guess in that on that note, um, I piss from Instagram and Threads at Comer Codex, <laughs> and several days a week I drop I drop trials, squat over your face, and shit on it from Twitch.tv slash Comer Codex. Um, that schedule is going to change slightly because, of course, with the new job, I'm not strictly nine to five anymore. Um, it's probably going to be Thursdays and Sundays, probably from about 4 p.m. Central Time. Uh, I like to play story based stuff lately, it's been Diablo 3 and Cult of the Lamb in that regard. And I also play a whole lot of Overwatch 2, uh, which is what I'm going to be getting back to tomorrow, actually, from 4 p.m. Central Time. Season 10 just started. Um, I'm on a ranked climb, just had a good coaching session today. So I plan to just settle in and just get some practice in. So come on down and root me on for a little while. We're going for gold this season. All right. Well, that's it. That's our review. Thank you for joining us here on the Long Road to Ruin. For he, Sean, you're not. I'm Mark. Be well, be safe, and behave.